Well, I want to say welcome uh, to each of you who are here today. I'm excited for the opportunity to be gathered back together. Uh, I'm going to be honest, I don't really enjoy preaching on video. And so uh, I, it's always uh, better to have you guys here with me. And so it, it's a delight for us to have the opportunity to gather this morning as the body of Christ. Uh, I need to celebrate a couple of things with you today. Uh, first off, uh, across the board, and I heard it over and over and over throughout this week, uh, people would make phone calls to me. Uh, I would hear Hear about needs that were being met. Um, I want to say thank you for being the church of Jesus Christ outside of a time where we gather together on a Sunday morning. Like I heard reports of people who got clothes that were given to them, people that were serving other people, shoveling driveways. Our deacons, by the, they're like they're mostly like mainly kind of men. They were buying uh, newborn clothes for children. I mean, they were out doing this stuff. Um, community groups serving people. Thank you for not settling for an hour of worship on a Sunday, but for being the church of Jesus Christ in our community, especially uh, in times of dire need. Now, that's our hope. Our, uh, we've told you this, our mission as, as a church is to lead all people to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus. Like, we don't stop until our lives are fully conformed to that of Jesus, and that won't happen until you're dead. So we're just going to keep going and encouraging you to pursue Jesus Christ, to be the church of Jesus Christ in our city. So that's celebration number one. Uh, number two, you might have seen Caleb and Haley up here leading a lot lately. For about the last 18 months, we've been in transition working with our Pecola campus in here. Caleb and Haley uh, connected with our church. Caleb grew up here um, as a young man, came up through our student ministry. Haley connected in here through The Crossing, which is a, a ministry we did to college-aged kids for a number of years. They met, fell in love, got married, have a kid, another one on the way. Uh, it's a beautiful story. They've also been serving at our Pecola campus for about six years, and as things kind of opened up here um, and began praying about who would fill that position. And so today, it's my pleasure to announce to you that Caleb and Haley will be our full-time worship leaders here at this campus. You're still going to see other people. Sometimes they'll still go back to Pecola, uh, but we're just really grateful for them being uh, willing to come and to serve this body as they've faithfully done at our Pecola campus as well. So can you all give them a quick round of applause? So. Okay, we got a lot going on this morning, so I'm just going to dive into the text. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. That's where we're going to begin today. Uh, really interesting uh, section of Scripture. Uh, Paul is about to use a derogatory term towards some people who would have claimed Christ as their Savior. Uh, we'll explain it later, but b before he does that, he says, Finally, my brethren, he's writing to the church in Philippi, the people whom he loves. Loves. Like he, he has significant like affection and joy with regard to this church in particular. He says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things again is no trouble to me. It's a safeguard for you. Paul just, he opens again. Re remember, rejoice. I, I, I told you that in the midst of suffering. We rejoice when I was beaten with rods when I was in Philippi. We rejoice when I was thrown in prisons. We rejoice uh, when he was in, in uh, chains in Rome. He rejoices no matter what the circumstances bring. And we're able to rejoice in the midst of difficult circumstances because of what we've been given in Christ. So he's like, just one more time. I don't know what you're going through, but you have reason to rejoice in the person and work of Jesus Christ. It was true for them and it's true for us. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what difficulty you're facing, but because of the love of Christ for you, His grace, His mercy, His forgiveness, we, as a body, have reason to rejoice. And then Paul just dives off in the deep end. Look what he says here in verse 2. He says, Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. Now, um, when Paul calls them dogs, it is a derogatory term without question, but what he's actually doing is using the language of what's known as the Judaizers against them. The Judaizers were men and women who have come to faith in Christ, or at least they said they had, um, but what they would do is look back to the Old Testament, um, begin to measure their lives against uh, how well they're living according to the Old Testament law, and to the extent that they were doing pretty well living according to the law, they would start to look down on other people. As a matter of fact, Philippi was a church full of what are known as Gentile believers. They were not from a Jewish line. They were Greeks. They were from all nations under heaven. And they'd come to faith in Christ, not as Jews, but as pagans before. 
Paul mentions a man named Epaphroditus in the letter whose name was, he was named after the Greek goddess Aphrodite. Okay, so he had a pagan background. He'd come to faith in Christ. But these Jews, these Judaizers, would come into the churches and they would look down on the Gentile believers. Like, you're not really a Jew. You're just kind of someone who kind of barely slid into the kingdom of God by virtue of faith in Christ. You're not a real Jew. As a matter of fact, they would go on and compel them. The men would have to be circumcised. They're like, hey, you got to observe the Sabbath. You need to look back to the Old Testament law if you're going to be a real Christian. So they were kind of puffed up, right? They're looking back to the old law like, hey, here's who I am. I'm a pretty good Jew. I mean, I kind of got Christ in the mix, but, um, you know. Uh, we're a little bit better than everyone else. And so Paul says about them, and this, listen, we all have this tendency, don't we? Like we come to faith in Christ, and when we come to faith in Christ, it's because we have recognized the depth of our own sin. Like, God, I've blown it. I'm not just like a pretty good person. I grew up in LaFore County. I've, you know, I, I, I do what I say I'm going to do. I'm a pretty good old boy. That's not how we came to Christ. We came to Christ on our knees because we were convinced that we were wicked and wretched sinners in need of a Savior. But much like these Judaizers, what we can often do is go back, look back to our old ways, begin to judge ourselves on the basis of our performance. And we begin to see our standing before God on the basis of, did I do pretty good this week or did I not? Did I sin a bunch or did I kind of have a good week? Like it's, and, and we think that that's how we're acceptable before God. Now these Judaizers thinking they were doing pretty well would come into the churches and refer to the Gentile believers as dogs. What that meant is you're unclean. You haven't observed the ritual of circumcision. You're unclean. You don't fit. You don't belong. And maybe if you're here today, there's no Judaizers telling you you're a dog, I hope. But maybe it's your own conscience. Maybe it's that old, old voice saying to you, you don't really belong here. And you got junk in your past. You're unclean. You need to clean yourself up. You need to do this and that. And then you would be acceptable before God. What Paul says about that kind of thinking, he responds kind of violently to it. He says, beware of those dogs, those evil workers, those of the false circumcision. He's like, listen, in, in believing in some way that you could clean yourself up, you could be good enough, and depending upon the law for any form of righteousness, you have departed from the gospel. That is the false circumcision, he calls it. And that's not faith in Christ at all. That's not what Jesus has called us to. It's not to depend on the weakness of our flesh, but we depend instead on the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf alone. We come to him in faith. You're not good enough. I'm not good enough. But Jesus was, and he offered his life on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. So Paul says, beware. Comparing yourself to the law, the old ways, the Old Testament, looking at all that like, oh, yeah, I don't measure up. Matter of fact, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, Paul told us the role of the law in our lives. The, the, the Old Testament is incredibly relevant for us, but the law was given for a purpose. He says this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. He says, Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified, not by our works, not by our adherence to the law, but we may be justified by faith in Christ. Like the law was there. The whole time to give us the recognition that we weren't that good. Like you should read the law and think, oh man, I'm in trouble. Like I need a Savior. That is the role of the law as a tutor to kind of lead us to faith in Christ. Now, let me, let me ask you this. If you left church today, um, you know, like we break here, you go to the restaurant or maybe you go home, you look out your back window and you see someone wandering around in your backyard. It's going to be weird, but you know, just go, we'll go with me for a minute. If you saw someone wandering around in your backyard uh, looking at a map, the only logical thing that you can conclude if you go ask, what are you doing? Well, I'm following this map. Um, the only logical conclusion is that they haven't yet found that which they're looking for, Right. I mean, if you're, you know, wandering through people's yards or, you know, going down the street or wherever, staring at a map, trying to follow it, you know, direction by direction, turn by turn, again, you would rightfully conclude that they probably had not yet found the thing which they're seeking. Were the Judaizers? Were these men who were looking back to their old ways of trying to get to God on the, virt uh, on the basis of their own virtue or their righteousness under the law? 
what Paul rightly concludes is they had not yet found the true treasure. They're still looking at the map. They're still following the tutor that's supposed to lead them to Christ. But tri- Christ is the true treasure. I mean, honestly, um, if we had a treasure map and we had actually found the treasure, um, we don't keep following the map anymore, right? We're like, no, 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 I found the treasure. I'm going to live it up according to these newfound riches that I have. And that's what God wants for you, and that's what God wants for me. He's like, hey, put aside your past. Put aside the brokenness of the life you've lived. Put aside the guilt, the shame. Jesus already took care of that. Now we have the riches of a life in Christ available to us. Don't live in guilt and shame anymore. Like, don't return to that old way of thinking. Matter of fact, he's like, that old way of thinking, and that wasn't the gospel at all. That's not treasure at all. That's emptiness, it's brokenness. It is a false gospel. When we look at ourselves, Compare to the Bible and be like, hey, how well am I performing? If I'm good enough, I think I'm acceptable before God. If I'm bad enough, God must be mad at me. You need to know, Justin's going to lay this out in a few minutes, that God saw you in all of your sin every single day of your life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And in love, he chose to die for you that you might find a new life in him, that you might come to to possess the true treasure of the riches of life lived according to Christ Jesus. He goes on um, to to kind of point out his life to these people that were measuring themselves against other believers. Hey, I kind of got this extra righteousness. I'm, I'm a pretty good Jew. I've been circumcised. Weird thing to brag about. But, you know, they were comparing themselves to the other believers in the church at Philippi. And, and they were, honestly, they were kind of bragging based upon, hey, you know, I'm a, I'm a Hebrew. I've got all these things going on. Paul says this in verse 3. He says, we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in our flesh. What he's saying is we put no confidence in what we do or don't do, our own righteousness. Anything that we can accomplish, we put zero confidence in that. Paul's like, but bear with me for a moment. If we're going to kind of judge ourselves on the basis of our Jewish credentials and how well we follow the law, let me just lay this out here for you. He says, although I myself might have confidence in the flesh, and if anyone has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I've got more. He's like, oh, you think you're like a level 7 Jew? Let me just show you what it means to be a true Jew. So he's going to list his credentials. He says, I was circumcised the eighth, eighth day. Again, strange thing to brag about, but it, was, uh, it gave them some street credibility with the Jews, right? I circumcised the eighth day, on the eighth day. I'm of the nation of Israel. This was actually a statement of kind of the purity of his lineage. He's like, my people didn't intermarry with outsiders. Like, I'm a Jew through and through of the nation of Israel. He says, of the tribe of Benjamin. In case you didn't want to know where I came from, I'm the tribe of Benjamin, one of the 12. You should know what that is. I'm legit, he says. He goes on and said, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. Now, among the the culture of their day, the Romans controlled most of the known world at that point. And uh, what was happening among the Jewish people was they were kind of becoming like the Greeks, taking on their customs, what's known as Hellenization. And so they kind of quit speaking Hebrew. They started speaking Greek, and they kind of began to adopt some of the customs. But there was a group of of Hebrews. They were like the holdouts. They're like, no, we're not going to do it. We're going to continue to speak Hebrew. We're going to continue to practice our Jewish cultural customs. We're not going to mix up with that. And Paul's like, I'm one of them. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. Like, I'm keeping it real as a Jew. I'm living according to the law like I've done it. I've resisted the Roman influence in my life. He continues on and says, as to the law, I'm a Pharisee. He's like, if you don't know law, I happen to be an attorney, right? I'm a, a Pharisee. People come to me to ask me how to rightly translate the law, and then they can look at my life to see how they should live it. Paul's just continuing to add to his credentials here as a good Jew. He goes on and says, as to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church. Now, the church would claim to worship the Most High God, the same God that the Jews worship. But he's like, "Uh uh-uh, new customs, not lawful for Jews. Like, the church had it wrong, or at least that's what Paul initially believed, to the extent that he went and got letters from the synagogues to put people in prison. He held the coats of the men who stoned Stephen to death for proclaiming the Christ in in their midst. And so Paul's like, hey, I was so zealous for Jewish traditions that I persecuted the church of Jesus. And he concludes here, 
That's the righteousness which is in the law. I was found blameless. Now, this isn't a statement that Paul never sinned. It just meant that even when he had messed up, now he followed the law really well. He was a Pharisee. He would tithe of every little spice in his cabinet, right? He followed the law, but when he would when he would sin, he'd fall short. He would offer the prescribed sacrifices. He followed all the customs. But Paul, it's like, okay, to these, these people that are, you know, thinking they're a little better because they've done this, to people who are putting confidence in their ancestry, their family, People have been confident in how righteous they are, whether or not they're a good old boy or a good old girl. People are like, hey, I was raised in church, went to Sunday school, got a perfect attendance pin. People would put confidence in the things they have or have not done. He's like, I've done all of it. Then he says this in verse 7. But whatever things were gained to me, whatever things you might point at, As a symbol that I'm definitely one of God's people. Something you might look at on the outside and think, okay, this guy's for real. Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Nation of Israel, loss for the sake of Christ. Legalistic righteousness, flawless, was loss for the sake of Christ. And what he's doing here is he's making a comparison. Christ is a treasure worth so much that anything that might have otherwise been considered credit to me, it feels like loss in comparison to the worth of Christ. He's like, listen, the law, the Jewishness, all the stuff, all that was meant to lead us toward Christ, to point us to him for sure. But I found the treasure. I found true life in Christ Jesus. And so all of that feels meaningless. It feels like loss by comparison. My question for you today Have you found the treasure of Christ? What are you trusting in? What would you have, what would you tend to put your confidence in? Going to church, prayed a prayer one time, walked an aisle when I was a kid. What do you put your confidence in? And Paul says, listen, I don't put confidence in any of that stuff. I put confidence in the work of Jesus Christ on my behalf, the work that he did, not the work that we could possibly do. As church people, sometimes we can be just like the Judaizers and start comparing ourselves. Am am I doing pretty good? Am I living a pretty good life? Which, by the way, Paul has told us to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus. But there's a difference between false circumcision, which is in the flesh, and the true circumcision. He's going to lay that out for us here in verse 3. He says, we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in our flesh. He actually calls people that were coming into the churches and telling people you need to be circumcised. He's like, they're mutilators of the flesh. It's meaningless what they're trying to get you to do. You know what matters is that your heart has been transformed. He's like, yeah, on the outside, you can, you can work really hard and you can kind of manage your external behaviors. You can be a pretty good old boy or a pretty good old girl in LaFour County. People can know your name. They can like you. They can speak well of you. People can, you know, like even your family name, be like, oh, yeah, they're good Christian folks. You can fake it on the outside. But true circumcision, true belonging to Christ Jesus means that you have a transformed heart. Can I tell you or ask you this today? Has your heart been transformed by the work of Jesus Christ on your behalf? Have you been made new, made alive in Christ Jesus? Or are you just working really hard trying to manage all the external things? Paul's like, you want to know what authentic faith looks like? You want to know what it looks like to belong to Christ Jesus? You worship in the Spirit of God. It means the Spirit of God stirs your affections for Him. He leads you in your day-to-day life. Your heart has been transformed. Your heart has been surrendered to the Holy Spirit of God. And here is the cry. Here's the thing that we do. We glory in Christ Jesus. This word glory, it just means to rejoice. And if we're going to brag, I'm not going to brag about how good we've been. We're going to like boast and share our story. It's not about how many times we go to church a week. It's not about how much of the Bible we read. We're going to boast. We're going to brag in the work of Jesus on our behalf. We were hopeless, helpless sinners who had been saved by the overwhelming, indescribable love of God for us. He offered his son Jesus to die the death that we deserved. Some of you 
today you're here and you feel like you don't really belong. You're not sure why you're here. You showed up today and you're like, oh, I don't really fit in the church scene, but I'm, I'm here. Um, some of you feel like you don't belong when you look at your past and your sin. I want you to know that Jesus Christ died that you might find true life in him, that you might find the treasure. If you're here today and you're living under the weight of guilt and shame for things you might have done, um, Jesus Christ died to take your guilt and your shame that you might live in freedom in him. The next few moments, our, our youth pastor, Justin Jackson, is going to come up. He's going to lead us in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the thing that we hope in. And then we're going to have a time of communion where we just remember and celebrate the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Would y'all give him a hand as he comes up today? I'm try to take the table away from me. Did y'all see that? <clears throat> so really been looking forward to this, and thank you, Jason, for asking me to do this. Um, when you think about the Lord's Supper, when you think about uh, communion, one word has always came to mind for me, um, and that word is remember. Remember. Um, remembrance can be a very powerful thing, and so we're going to talk about some things, some verses this morning that I want you guys to remember as you take communion you know a lot of these we need to remember daily uh like jason just said through this whole thing we just uh man we don't deserve any of this we didn't earn salvation and so uh so if if you have your bibles up they're gonna be up to the screen i got some verses to share with you and and uh, the first verse i want you to remember is uh romans 3 23 i want you to remember romans 3 23 that we've all sinned and every one of us has fallen short of God's glory. Ephesians 2.1 says that we were dead in our trespasses and our sins. The Bible says that we can be a slave to sin. So we all start out, guys, in the same spot. I mean, it doesn't matter how good you think you are. It doesn't matter how bad you think you are. We all start out as sinful. That's where we're at. And <clears throat> if that was it, we'd be in a bad spot right now, wouldn't we? We wouldn't be here today. We would have nothing to worship or talk about, okay? But I want you to remember Romans 6.23. Because Romans 6.23 is a good one to remember because I mean, it's the gospel. I mean, it is the good news of Jesus. Mark it in your Bible. Highlight it on your phone, in your Bible, because it's the gospel, okay? Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but... The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what do we get for being that sinner? We get death. And that's not talking about, that, about physical death. We're all physically dying right now. We're all going that direction. We're all getting older every day. We're all going to physically die. That's talking about spiritual death, total separation forever from God, not heaven. We're talking about hell, okay? That's what we get for being a sinner. That's our wage for being a sinner. But there is a free gift, okay? And that free gift is eternal life. I'm sorry. That free gift is of God. It's from God. It is eternal life. And it's found only in Jesus, in Jesus only. Not in doing good. Not in earning anything, okay? So remember that today. Remember the gospel. Remember Romans 6.23. The wage of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. And it's in Christ Jesus I want you to remember Romans 5, 8 this morning as you take communion. Man, this one, I love Romans 5, 8. Romans 5, 8 says, uh, For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But God showed his love for us, but while we we're still sinners, Christ died for us. That's, that's what that means. That means on my worst day, and I have a lot of them I can look back on in 44 years. On my worst day, days, Day. I mean, the day I was the worst, worst person. You know that day for you, that them days for you, okay? That's the day that Christ died for your sins. That's the day that Christ died for my sins. My worst day. He looked at me on my worst day and said, I love that man. I want to die for him on the cross. That is it. I mean, that's, that is so powerful to me to think about and remember this morning as we take communion because... We all have them. If you're age 8 to age 80 in here, you have worse. You know, right now you're thinking about it. You're like, Justin, why would you bring that up? 
I didn't want to think about that this morning, right? <laughs> I don't either. But I can think that I can be thankful that day. That's the day that Christ died for me. I didn't have to go be good, be good, get good, do 10 things and make me, you know, just before I accepted Jesus. No, no. He, he died for me while I was still a sinner. So remember Romans 5, 8. Remember Romans 10, 13. That everyone who, named, who calls the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't matter what you've done. It don't matter, <laughs> again, how good you are, how bad you are, what color of skin you have. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter. Everyone who calls the name of the Lord will be saved. Remember that this morning as you take communion because you didn't, again, we go back to the same thing. We didn't do anything to deserve salvation. And lastly, remember Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. I want to read it to you. It says this, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one, and, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So you remember this morning that you, when you did that, remember that time that you gave your life to Christ. You might remember that time this morning that you rededicated your life to Jesus. You. You recommitted your life to Christ. You know, you don't, I've heard pastors, preachers say, you know, you better know the exact moment and they have their sayings and all that, exact time and, and date. That's baloney. Just, you know when it was. And you know that moment in your heart. And so as you take communion this morning, I want you to remember that. I want you to remember that moment that you gave your life to Christ. We can have the, the deacons come on up. I'm going to read to you guys out of Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 26 of the account of the Lord's Supper. And so what I want to um, to have you do is we're going to get up here in a minute and we're going to follow through here. uh, and, and, And these guys have got some juice and some crackers and you can go back to your seat and you can take communion with your family, with your community group, by yourself, with your friends. However you want to do it, you can bless uh, this um, and, and remember the broken body, remember the bloodshed of Jesus. And, uh, but communion, here's the deal, communion is for believers. So if you're a believer in here today, we don't care where you got saved, when you got saved, you come and join us at, with this time. Um, but if you're not a believer, here's what I want you to do. I, I want you to get up anyway. And I want you to come up here, and I want you to grab me or Jason or one of these deacons or bring somebody with you. We've got, we got like three or four rooms over here. We'd love to sit down with you and share the gospel with you and talk more about what it means to become a Christian. And so you come up anyway, and you grab one of us, and we'll share the gospel with you. And, and we're not going to force you into anything, but we'd love to just have that conversation, continue that conversation this morning. I want to read to you now. And then after I get done reading this, you guys can stand and and come up and get uh, your communion cups. Matthew chapter 26, started at verse 26. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples. And said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, He gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. You guys can.